Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, one of the last things I did before leaving for the long weekend was to upload, or well, to record your test grades, or so I thought. But at least Chad told me that his doesn't show up. So I will check that again when class is over, because you know I want you to know what, what you have. Um, I told you about the disparity between the grades, and so I decided to grade it out of 90 points rather than out of 100 points. Um, the two high scores then go to, to idiot scores. Um, I, I say that because I, I had a teacher who gave me a grade like that when I was in general chemistry. I thought it was dumb because I didn't have to try for the rest of the semester. Um, so I, I talked to the two students involved so they would understand that I understand the stupidity of what I did. But it, it makes everyone else's grade more reasonable because I do think that people were generally prepared. I know specifically one student who came and talked and was very prepared to appear the day before and then the exam just things didn't work out. And so I want to want to take that into account. Um, we have the uh, two people have exam the actual exams and we can talk about you know the the points, what was lost and get our learning experience. Yes, sir. So it's what's put in now. <laughs> The uh, now with uh, out of ninety instead of hundred. Um, does yours show up with the grade? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay. Um, so so at least I got some of them in right. Um, it should show up with a score that says what it was out of hundred, and then a percentage is calculated out of ninety. Okay. <laughs> so so you have both the numbers. Depends on which one you look at. You should see both. All right, we ended last class period talking about the electric motor. So today we'll get that all squared away. Um, <laughs> I was looking at the schedule and apparently I've been going slow. We'll try to get up to date. Uh, remember when we're working with forces on current carrying wires, we have the equation for the magnitude of the force is current times the length of the wire times the magnetic field times the sine of the angle between the current and the magnetic field. So you find the magnitude using this equation. If current is zero, if magnetic field is zero, or if the angle between the current and magnetic field is zero, then there's no force and life is easy. Otherwise, calculate that and then use the right-hand rule to determine the direction of L cross B, and that's the direction of the force. So those are our basic things to do in looking at forces on current carrying wires. And so we come back to the basic electric motor. Notice the construction of the basic electric motor. You have a north and a south magnet. So you have magnetic field lines. Magnetic field lines go out of north and into south. So you have the magnetic field lines going across there. And then you have the currents, which are in brown here. And so you use the right-hand rule on each one of those to determine what direction the force is going to be. And we ended last class where we were talking about the net force on this motor is zero. So Newton's second law, if the net force is zero, then the acceleration should be, what should the acceleration be if the net force is zero? Zero. But, what was that? But we have one remaining thing, torque. Torque. There's our symbol for torque, is equal to R cross F. So our picture shows the actual only two forces acting. And then we want to calculate the torque. Now, torque is calculated about an axis. So because this electric motor is made so it can rotate about an axis, we calculate the torque about the axis that it can rotate about. So my axis is the line coming down the center. You can see it marked there. Zoom in, you can see the axis much better. I'm still going to make it darker. Darker in green. So there's the axis of rotation. So if I want to calculate torque, once again, remembering that torque is equal to uh, R cross F, then let's look at wire two here so wire two is this wire right here 
using the right hand rule, which finger should, well, which direction should the index finger point? Tell me variable first. R, right. It's always the index finger points in the direction of the first item in the crossbar. So R was first, hence index finger points in the direction of R. Then comes the question of what is R? R is the vector that points from the axis of rotation to where the force is acting. So in this picture, what direction is R pointing? Indicate with your finger of your right hand. Okay. I see a total of about five fingers pointing. I want everyone to be involved. Okay, chat, or chat. I come up with wrong names all the time. I called Andrew Aaron, I called Ryan Chad. <laughs> right, where does R point from and to? Okay, points from the axis of rotation, so that's from the green line, to where the force acts. So if we're looking at force two, what direction should R be pointing? This way. Nope. Mm -hmm. From the green line oh, to the blue. Way. So R should be pointing that way. Then what direction should our middle middle finger point? Okay, down because that's the direction of the second item in the cross product. It's R cross F. So middle <laughs> finger points down, and then what direction is my thumb point? Okay. In. Okay, in. So my thumb is pointing in. So the torque caused by force two. Is going that direction. How you feel about that? Question. Why is it the second force in the um, I, I decided to do F2 first. Oh, okay. that's, that's why. Okay. The other one is called F4, so I went two before four. Okay. Does that mean there's a, there's a force in the curve in both directions then? There's a what? Is it torque in both directions then? Well, that's the torque off of that one. Why? Because there's two forces. There's two forces, so we're going to have to go to the other one and also calculate it. Okay. Now, just to make sure we're complete, torque one's direction is indicated with that arrow, and the magnitude of torque one, or torque two, excuse me, the magnitude of torque two is going to be this length of the wire, which is A times the current times the magnetic field. Remember, the equation was... Um, IL cross B, and so the magnitude of the force was ILB sine theta, but the angle between the radius and the force here was 90 degrees, so sine 90 degrees is 1. I dropped it off. So that's torque 2. Now I need to calculate, oh wait, I forgot one thing. This here is just the force. What did I forget? Torque is blank cross force. R. I've got to have the radius. What's the radius here? The radius was pointing like this. If it's B from left side to right side, then the radius is one half B. Go away, box. So there in red, I have the radius. And in blue, I have the force, so that's the torque when I put it together. Now we look at the torque due to four. So let's pick on another person. Don't mock. <laughs> there, there is an Aaron Cabrera. That, there was at school here, so at least I there, – there's no Chad Dieter as far as I know. But, um, let's go to Chad. Chad, what direction is the torque caused by force four? First, well, what direction is the radius? Let's start with that. No, it's the opposite direction. Because we're going to, force four is on the other side of the axis. The arrows there were actually the 
magnetic field directions. But the radius vector is pointing from the axis for rotation to where the force acts. So from the green line to where the blue line is. So if I was going to be super accurate in my drawings, oh shoot, that was too much. If I was going to be super accurate in my drawings, I would have moved them down a line. So you'd have the R's going like this and like this, each one being B over two. <laughs> That's a B, trust me. Okay, so take your right hand, point your finger in that direction. Then what direction is the force? What direction is your thumb point? Into the paper again. So it's the same direction, but now it's this radius, which again was one half B times this force, which was the same as before of I A capital B. And so that's torque four. So now if we add up these two torques, both torques are pointing the same direction. So what is the magnitude of the total torque? What do I get when I add those two up? It's not hard math, friends. Uh, they're identical, right? So if I have one half IABB plus one half IABB, it's So there's my total torque. Now, here's where I go from rigorous work to hand waving work. If that's a rectangle of dimensions A and B, what would A times B represent? The area. That's true for this case. It turns out if we were to do the rigorous work, it'd be true for every case. So in every case, the net torque is equal to I A B. So if I make the area of my coil bigger, it's gonna increase the torque. If I make the magnetic field bigger, it increases the torque. If I increase the, in the current, it increases the torque. Of course, when we make an electric motor, we usually don't have a single coil. We make a bunch of loops. If we make a bunch of loops, each loop is going to contribute the same torque. So the total torque would be the number of loops times this. And so if we have multiple loops, we add in N for the number of loops we have. Now you'll see this written all kinds of different ways, and I write it in this order so I never get confused. I can remember NBA, National Basketball Association. There's no I, because I can't play basketball, in NBA. So the torque is I NBA. That's the torque created by an electric motor. Maximum torque. Because this was in one configuration. What happens if it's – I'm sure I have a picture, but I'm just going to draw it. <clears throat> what happens if I have my magnetic fields like this? And I have my coil, so the axis is coming right out at you here. Current is going, let's say, in there and coming out here. Now what's the radius going to be? The radius isn't going to be, well, the radius is this distance here still. That's still the radius. But now there's an angle between the radius and the magnetic field. And that angle between the radius and magnetic field is that angle, right? So <clears throat> it's going to be a smaller torque because you have the radius that's perpendicular is not the full radius. And it's only the perpendicular radius that is going to be useful to us. Now, with this said, 
we actually defined we defined the angle as the angle between the normal and the magnetic field. So we actually define the angle as this angle here. And with that angle, it turns out that the torque at any orientation is I N B A sine of that angle. So sine of the angle between the area <clears throat> and the area is defined a direction that is normal to it. So sine of the angle between the area and the magnetic field. So the torque, if you go around the circle, sine gets as big as plus one, it gets as small as minus one. So it's going to have a torque that makes it start to rotate. When it gets to where the angle between the area and the magnetic field is zero, that is when it gets to that orientation, then there's going to be no torque. No torque means no angular acceleration. Going back to Newton's second law, the rotational form, alpha is equal to the net torque moment of inertia. Acceleration is going to be zero when you're in that orientation shown with the vertical dashed bar. And then if it goes past there, the direction of the torque is going to reverse. If you think about it very hard, that doesn't make for a very good motor. You start the motor like this, it has a torque to make it get like this, and then it's going to have the torque reverse to slow it down as it keeps going. And so best case scenario, if I built my motor very naively the way I've just shown, best case scenario is it goes like this. Just goes back and forth. Good luck going down the road with an electric motor that's doing that. So we have to do something to improve on it. And there's really two ways of doing it. You can make a DC motor or you can make an AC motor. A DC motor needs a special case. This is just going through the math we've already done. This is showing us the angle calculations we just did. <laughs> I just go past that. Um, yeah. How can an electric motor continue to operate with a DC battery? What we do is we make what's called a split commutator. Here is the split commutator. You have a, a pad right here and another pad that you can just barely see right there. And then these metal things are called brushes. Those, the brushes are the contacts. And so you have your power supply going to those brushes and then those pads are going to connect to one side or the other side of a coil. And so every half turn, your brushes change from one pad to the other. So the current was going, let's say, this direction. It rotates around, so it keeps going like this. And then you get to the halfway point, and all of a sudden the current reverses direction. Reverse the direction of the current, what are you doing to the torque? You're reversing the direction of the torque. So if you have the pad sets, you reverse the direction of the torque at the same time that the torque goes negative, then you're going to make it so that the torque is continuing to make it go the same direction because you had two reversals at the same location. So that's one way of making it continue to operate with just a DC source. You use just a split commutator. You have those pads. That's what this little motor here has. Now, I, these motors are a little temperamental. I didn't try this beforehand, so I'm going to live life a little dangerously. If you look at this, it's a little more complicated. It has three different windings. So each one of those windings we can treat like a motor. And so with those three different windings, it also has three different pads on there. So at any point in time, only two wires are connected which means that I'm going to have not all of them working at any given yeah, not all of them working at any given time because only two or three wires are connected. But it will then allow me to have a motor that switches out when you're at maximum torque each time. Instead of just going from zero to maximum to zero, it's going like from 50% to 50% and then going up again and again. So you're having a higher continuous torque. The brushes are the tricky thing. You can see these little pieces of wire. I have to pinch them on there, but not pinch so hard to create friction that it won't turn. So that's where things get tricky. This here is an important part of the electric motor. You have to have that external magnetic field. 
So this has magnets glued on to give us the magnetic field. What difference does it make if I put it this way versus this way? If I change the direction of the magnetic field, so instead of south being on top of that picture, I have north on top. It reverses the direction of torque, so it's going to rotate the opposite direction. So it still works just fine, just um, reverses the direction. So let's go ahead and give this, ah, give it a whirl. It's a funny kind of guy. Um, it also has, well, it has a current meter, which can also be a point of failure, sadly. So right now, nothing's happening because, well, because my contacts came off. And because my brushes aren't touching anything. So now I've got to get the brushes to contact. You can see it quiver a little when I get contact, but you got to get just right. And apparently I have the wires in the wrong order because it's measuring no current. It doesn't show negative, it only shows positive. So can't help it again. Got to switch these so I can actually see a current. See if I can get it right again. And it's using an average of about one amp of current to make the electric motor run. You see, electric motors can be very simple in design. Can be. If you want to make an optimized motor, well, then you put a whole lot more. Um, emphasis in design, it becomes much more complicated. So this is the design of a simple electric motor. Electric motors are gaining more and more attention. Why are they gaining more and more attention? Electricity is a more eco-friendly energy source. That's a... It's kind of a hard, hard one to say because where does that electricity come from? It comes from primarily burning fossil fuels. Yes. But they are generally going to be more or less pollutant per energy produced with the fossil fuel in the power plant that's designed to be optimal and run continually than in your, um, your inter internal combustion engine. Yeah, the car. So, so it, it is, but you have to qualify and understand. And then you have things like losses in the grid, right? You have power coming from the grid. And I read somewhere that we lose around 50% of that power in distribution. So they produce about twice as much energy per second power as is actually consumed by consumers and the rest is lost in one way or another. So there's, it's, it's a fairly complicated thing in terms of, of eco-friendly. And, and there is always the equation of the batteries and the huge amount of pollution that goes into making the batteries that we use in our electric vehicles which makes them, as I understand it, at best, environmentally neutral compared to a car. You know? And, yeah. Well, I'm saying that's the argument of why some people might be interested. Yes, that's right. That's right. And, and frankly, I've been interested in getting an electric vehicle. I was going to buy one, and then I looked at the, the numbers, and you know, the, the cost numbers are very similar when we get down to the end, even with the government subsidy. And the pollution numbers are very similar when you get down to the end. And it's like, well, let's get an efficient gas car and, and go with that. But that's, that's a big reason. And electricity doesn't have to come from burning fossil fuels. We can have power plants that are nuclear, which I think is great, although apparently uh, it's not part of the Green New Deal. Nuclear is bad, according to her. Um, we have hydrothermal power, um, hydroelectric um, you have yeah, hydroelectric, what we call dam, hydrothermals from geysers or such. So we have other sources that are more environmentally friendly than burning fossil fuels. But those are still a minor component because the cost to produce energy is pretty low for fossil fuels and it's higher for the others. But prices over the last two decades have come quite a bit down on alternatives, which makes, once again, it's more, <clears throat> more compelling to look into. Nathan, what's another reason to look at electric motors again? Torque, <laughs> get, get some torque, get, get off that line fast. Okay, here's a picture showing, well, essentially what I did, except for once again, it's a single 
um, single term. Ampere's law. Gauss's law in the physics 252 class, we covered that. In the physics 152 class, all I told you about Gauss's law was that the electric field coming out of a region is proportional to how much charge is enclosed. And we saw that practically by just saying how many electric field lines come out of this charge. If it has a bigger charge, it has more lines coming out, which means the lines are closer together, which means the strength is higher. So that was Gauss's law. Ampere's law, and, and I'll just go ahead and say it in English for the rest of the time. <laughs> Ampere's law is a very similar law to Gauss's law, and in, we are going to cover Ampere's law in this class as well, of course, as the calculus class. So <clears throat> Ampere's law um, is where – this is Gauss's law here. Gauss's law says the magnetic flux coming out of any closed surface is – equal to the magnetic charge enclosed. But what did we learn about magnetic charge? Fundamentally different from electric charge in that there is no monopole. You can't have just a naked north. You always have a north with a south of equal magnitude. So the net magnetic charge in any volume is always zero, which means that Gauss's law for magnetism says that if you make any closed surface, you always have the amount of magnetic field lines coming in as equal to magnetic field lines coming out, going out. You can never have a difference. So we don't talk about Gauss's law for magnetism at all at this level because it basically just gives us a zero equation all the time. But Ampere's law talks about a path, and we have to talk about this in the general physics class because it's very vital for electromagnetic waves. So Ampere's law, we talk about the circulation or the magnetic field parallel to a loop. So the circulation is the sum of magnetic fields times length for a loop. You have to see it in practice for it to make sense, I think. So, yeah, do I have a picture? Yeah, here's the picture. So I have a wire with current I going through it. And then I make an imaginary loop. It's not a real loop. It's not like I have a wire there that's doing a circle. I make an imaginary loop, and on that loop, I'm going to calculate the magnetic field dotted to the length of wire. Well, magnetic field lines always close. They always form loops. So if I have a wire, the symmetry of the wire demands that the magnetic field should look the same from any angle, as long as I'm just going around like this. And so the only way you can make loops that look the same from any angle is if those loops are circular loops. So the magnetic field lines have to be doing circles around the wire. It's the only thing that can work with the rule that they have to do loops and the symmetry. So then we say, by convention, we define the magnetic fields such that if I point my thumb in the direction of the current of the wire and wrap my fingers around the wire, they tell me the direction that the current's going. Right hand, by the way. So if I have current going this direction, going to your right, I take my right hand, and if I want to find what's the magnetic field due to this current at Chad's location, what direction is Chad from here? That way. So I'm going to wrap my fingers so I have my fingers going between Chad and the wire. And the direction my fingers are pointing in that location is the direction of the magnetic field at Chad. So what direction would the magnetic field at Chad be pointing? Down, right. Down, correct. So you can find the magnetic field. What direction would the magnetic field be at the floor due to the current going to your right? Away from me. And on my side? Up. Right, so we have this right-hand rule that we can use to determine the direction of the magnetic field at any location. That's our convention that goes along with magnetic field length to come out of north and going to south. What does Chad represent in terms of physics? Chad just represents a location. Okay. It's just any arbitrary location? Yeah. And so I chose that location, then I used geometry with my right hand to figure out what direction it's going to be there. Okay. So now, to find the circulation in this, we have the imaginary circle and I say, okay, 
if I go along the circle, at every point on the circle, the wire is parallel to the magnetic field. I chose the circle because of that. So if I do the circulation, the sum of the magnetic field dotted with the length along that pathway, it's just going to be magnetic field times the length. What do you call the length of a circle? <coughs> the circumference, which is 2 pi r. And so Ampere's law says that the sum of the magnetic fields times the length of the circulation, in this case, is b times 2 pi r. That should be equal to mu zero. That's a new constant. That's the permeability of free space multiplied by the current that's enclosed by my imaginary loop. So if I have a wire going through this imaginary loop, the current enclosed is going to be the current going through that wire. And so it's going to be mu zero times the current in the wire. What's the point you ask? I mean, this world doesn't have a point. The point is now we can relate how much magnetic field is created by current going through a wire. If I solve that equation for I, or excuse me, for B, I find the magnetic field due to current going through a wire is mu I, that permeability of free space, times I, the current going through the wire, Divide by 2 pi times the radius of the distance from the wire to where I'm checking the magnetic field. So I have two things I have to do here. Ampere's law tells me the magnitude of the magnetic field. And then my right-hand rule tells me the direction of it. So, like I said, this is useful. We can calculate the direction of the magnetic field. Usually I have a demonstration set up for this. It was first discovered that current made a magnetic field when I think it's Hans Christian Ersted was setting up to do a demonstration, you know, big lecture demonstration. And he's got an electric wire running past his compass. And then when he turns on the power for his electric stuff, he saw the compass needle move. Why would the compass needle move? Well, it moves in response to a magnetic field. And so it was here as he's getting ready for this big presentation, he makes a new discovery that current going through a wire creates a magnetic field. And then we have Ampere's law, Ampere's law to give us what that actual relationship is. So <clears throat> we're going to use this in a few different geometries to make sure we understand Ampere's law. So oh, first, yes, this is good to review. It wires current current to the right on the screen. Current's going like that. What direction is the magnetic field produced by the current at the point directly below the wire? So what direction is the magnetic field? Okay. We have a confident into the screen. We get that answer by using the right-hand rule. How should I use my right-hand rule to get that answer? Okay. Point your thumb in the direction of the current. Underneath, if I wrap my fingers, it's going into the screen. Got that? Yes. This seems good. Um, <clears throat> this here is a different situation. What's different about this compared to the situation I already did? What was the geometry for this situation? A straight wire. Here we have wire going in a loop. Well, that's that's different. My geometry for doing this is also going to be different. And I'm going to actually skip to the next one, that a coil with multiple loops instead of the single loop to do the geometry calculation for you to get the magnetic field. But here we're going to apply the right-hand rule again to find the direction of the magnetic field created when I have a coil of wire. Now, we saw with the electric motor that I essentially made a coil because I had a current going around the loop. And that created a torque. Well, magnetic fields will create a torque to try to make them align. And so it actually works with what we saw in the generator, that if I have a loop, it's going to act like it's making a bar magnet. So for this loop, if I take my right-hand rule, 
I can take my right hand, I can see the picture on your left. The thumb is pointing parallel to the wire and going around the circle. And on the inside, what direction the fingertips pointing, no matter where you are in the circle? Up. So the magnetic field inside is going to be up from each piece of wire. So you add that all up, and you're going to get a strong magnetic field that's up inside the wire. Now, outside of the wire, what direction would your fingers point? If you look on the outside, so on the inside here, your fingers are pointing up. What direction are they going to point on the outside? Down. down. Outside to point down, but if you consider this, when you're on the inside here, all of them are pointing together. But if you're on the outside, you're going to have up from this hand and down from the other hand. Now, the down one is bigger because it's closer. So you're going to have a net downward just for matting those two, but they're not working together. They're working against each other. And so when we're outside of the loop, we have them working against each other, and the magnet field is much weaker. So looking at a picture here of the magnet field lines, what tells you about the strength of the field? What aspect of looking at magnet field lines tells you about the strength of the field? Okay, somebody said the density, the separation. The closer they are, the stronger the magnetic field. The farther apart, the weaker. So you have a strong magnetic field inside of the coil, spread out much more away, so weaker outside. That's when we talk about a coil, we usually concentrate on the magnetic field inside and ignore the magnetic field outside. We know it's there, but it's not nearly as strong. So we give ourselves a second right-hand rule that is really the first right-hand rule for determining the direction of current through a wire, but applied to a coil. And in that case, you take your right hand again, wrap it the direction that the current is going in the loop. So fingers are now the current. And your thumb points the direction of the magnetic field inside of the loop. So in this picture in the middle, the, magnet, the current is coming out over the top. So I take my right hand and orient so my fingers are coming out over the top. My thumb points to your right, hence the magnetic field inside the coil is pointing to your right. What's, what direction is the magnetic field pointing outside of the coil? Left. Left, because they're doing loops, so it had to be opposite. But we usually just focus on the inside. So that's a second right-hand rule for direction of magnetic field. That's really an application of the first one, simplified. So you don't have to memorize the second one as long as you have the first one memorized and know how to apply it. But it makes life a little easier. Now for the solenoid. A solenoid is a coil of wires. If you put current through those wires, you're going to create a magnetic field. And each one of those wires is going to have a magnetic field on the inside pointing the same direction. So it's going to add and make a much stronger magnetic field. So for this coil, we really care about the magnetic field inside again. And so here's how we determine the magnetic field inside using Ampere's law. We need to make a shape that is going to make calculation easy. And the shape we choose is one like this. We make a shape that has some length, and I'll call it A, that is parallel to the magnetic fields inside the coils. And then it has sides that are perpendicular to that going up. And we make it so it has this side here. Approaching infinity. Now you might look at that and say, wait, how realistic is this? Frankly, I don't care. This is an imaginary shape that I use for calculational purposes. We also make A so it's really, really tiny. If A is really, really tiny, then I'm going to have the magnetic field lines on either side. I shouldn't have done that. The magnetic field lines here and here are both going to be the same angle, roughly perpendicular to the wire. So when I apply Ampere's law, Ampere's law says 
the sum of the magnetic field dotted to lengths on the entire loop is equal to mu ot times the current enclosed. And so if I go around this loop, let's do this side first. If I go from here to here, that's length B. But how much of the magnet field is parallel to that length? None of it. It's always perpendicular to it. So I get for this side here, B dot L. Remember, you have to have vector signs or it means something completely different. B dot L is equal to zero because B is horizontal and L is vertical. Likewise, on this side here, B dot L is equal to zero because B is vertical and L, or excuse me, B is horizontal and L is vertical. So the dot product is zero because they're perpendicular to each other. And dot products are multiplying parallel parts. Out here at the top, B dot L is equal to zero because I'm infinitely far away. Being infinitely far away with the one over R relationship, where we had for a single wire, So for each individual wire, the magnetic field out there is zero because you're infinitely far away. You add a bunch of zeros up and you still get zero. And so B dot L is zero for three of the four sides. I have one side remaining. Inside, it's going to be B times A. equals B times A because inside the magnetic field is parallel to the length. And it's whatever that magnetic field is inside, which is why I'm looking for, hence I just called it B. So I do my entire circulation and I get B times A is equal to mu ot times the current enclosed. But now I have myself a conundrum. How much current is enclosed? Well, it depends on how many wires I have in my loop, right? Depends on how big A is. And so we define, let, there's no N in let. N equal, you can see why I put an N in there. My brain did it for me. N equal the number of turns divided by the length of my coil. So my coil has a length L and it has a number of turns. So lowercase n is the ratio of those. If that's the case, then number of loops enclosed is equal to the length of my, or the width, I should say, of my box times the number of turns per unit length. And so the current enclosed is equal to the number of loops enclosed times the current going through each loop. And now I can complete my calculation. So I have B times A is equal to mu watt times A and I. Divide both sides by A, and I have the magnetic field inside of a solenoid is mu watt times the number of turns per unit length times the current. Now, this is important because you only have three parameters here that are going to change your magnetic field for a solenoid. You have the number of turns per length, the current, and your constant mu i. So if I make a solenoid that's this long or this long, the length doesn't matter. It's the number of turns per length. So if I make 100 turns per length, it doesn't matter how long the solenoid is, I'm going to have the same magnetic field inside. So it's just how many wires you have per unit length that matters. So when you're making your solenoids, like I don't know if anyone's making one for their projects, I forgot. The key to getting a big magnetic field is to have a bunch of loops close together. 
It's not to have a long coil. And I have five minutes left. I will now go back to this. To actually get this equation here, this is for a circle. Current going in a circle. I actually use calculus to get that. So that's why I skipped over it. So the magnetic field at a single circle, the center is mu i n i. And I said a single circle. And then I have n. n is number of loops. This here is for a proverbial special case where you have no length at all to a solenoid. If there's no length, it really doesn't work out unless you have one loop. So usually we just put mu i n over 2r. But that's the magnetic field at the center if you have a single loop. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about some applications. We talked about applications of electric fields, and we have a capacitor that stores energy in the form of an electrical charge separation. One of the we magnetic fields is we make a coil that is going to store energy in the form of a magnetic field. And so the picture on the left there is, is a coil, it's a solenoid, and it will store energy in the magnetic field. And we will learn, probably in two lectures from now, about self-inductance and how we use those electric circuits. But for now, it's going to store electricity. If I put current through this wire, it's going to create a magnetic field and store energy in that magnetic field. And then if I stop producing current, it's going to try to produce current on its own to return that energy. Here is an MRI. I don't know about you guys. I've had pretty much all these medical procedures. You know, I hurt my knee, had to have an MRI in the knee. They put you in a strong magnetic field. First thing, if they put you in a strong magnetic field, you don't want to have things that are ferromagnetic with you. So, you know, like pieces of iron or whatnot. My dad got a pacemaker a couple months ago. He can't have an MRI now because he's got conducting metals in him or conducting has magnetic metals in him. If they put him in one of these, you put a strong magnetic field and ferromagnetic material, you create a net force and it's going to be pulling on his heart and that's not good. So people who have screws in their legs and stuff, if those screws are made out of material that's magnetic, you can't do an MRI on them because it's not safe. And of course, research grade MRIs. Um, do you guys know what MRI is? What does it stand for? Magnetic resonance imaging. When I was a child, it was NMR. Nuclear magnetic resonance. And everybody was like, oh, it's nuclear, it's danger, danger. And so they changed the name so people wouldn't be scared. What's going on here is we are looking at the magnetic properties of the nuclei of atoms. Right? The bisotes atoms, each atom has a nucleus. We're looking at the magnetic moments, i.e. the spin, because spin is the name we give to the magnetic moment of the nuclei in the atoms. And so to look at the spin, you have to create first a very strong magnetic field, and then you perturb it with a, an alternating magnetic field, and you see if you can make them flip. So they need strong magnetic fields. And one way of making them would be to make a continuous coil like this. But a cheaper way is to make what's called a Helmholtz coil. A Helmholtz coil has just two coils separated by a distance equal to the radius of the coil. And with that geometry, it turns out that you create a strong magnetic field that's uniform throughout this entire region as if it was like this. And so that's generally what you're going to do is use Helmholtz coils to create that strong magnetic field. And on that, I will stop. And I'll come back here and stop the recording too.